So now we've got to go and uh, take a look at substitution elimination in conjunction with each other. So it turns out they're often competing with each other. Uh, so you can't just look at them isolated here. We're going to have to put the last two chapters all together here. So uh, I do want you to keep a couple things in mind. SN2 is all about backside attack, and both SN1 and E1 are all about carbocation formation. And as you notice, SN1 and E1 being both about carbocation formation, the exact same set of circumstances are going to favor both. So substrates, tertiary is better than secondary. Primaries don't usually react. Uh, weak nucleophile for SN1, weak base for E1. We'll find out they're one and the same. Uh, the solvent has to, has to, has to be polar protic for both SN1 and E1, and the leaving group trend is the same across the board. Um, so that's SN1 and E1. So we'll find out that your weak nucleophile weak bases are most commonly water and alcohols, but a carboxylic acid could also be on that list. Uh, and typically, you're going to have a competition of reactions. Uh, so you get both a, an SN1 product and an E1 product or products. You might get plural. Um, so you got to know how to predict your products there. Uh, the only time we might not get a competition between the two is if there are no beta hydrogens. If there's no hydrogens on the beta carbons, you can't do elimination. So that might be the only case. Um, so typically you got to predict a mixture of products and it's hard to really know which is the major between the two, except potentially at elevated temperatures. At elevated temperatures, it turns out the E1 is a little bit favored uh, due to some entropy considerations. Um, if we go down the list here, we can kind of take a look. Uh, it turns out that your nucleophile or your base will be the single biggest determining factor of what mechanism you're doing. So again, your weak nucleophile weak base was SN1E1, but there are strong nucleophiles that are weak bases. And there are strong nucleophiles that are also strong bases. And then there are strong bulky bases that are not really good nucleophiles. Uh, so in this case, if you're a strong nucleophile, you can do SN2 if you're a strong base E2. And so if you're both, We'll take a look at those first here. Then you might have to worry about both SN2 and E2. And your, your strong nucleophiles that are strong bases are typically either hydroxide or alkoxide. So like sodium hydroxide, sodium methoxide, sodium ethoxide. Um, those typically you might see a competition between SN2 and E2. Uh, in this case, if it's a tertiary halide, you don't have to worry about SN2. So SN2 is all about backside attack and it doesn't work for tertiary halides. But outside of that, um, actually, I guess for a methyl halide, you can only do SN2 because you can't do elimination for a methyl halide. Uh, but for primary and secondary halides, you're going to see a competition between SN2 and E2, and we'll talk more about that. Um, if you look at your uh, strong nucleophile weak bases, they're strong nucleophiles so they can do SN2, but because they're not strong bases, we don't have to worry about competition with E2, so it's just SN2. And almost all of these have a negative charge. We got cyanide, azide, chloride, bromide, iodide, and then a couple different types of sulfide uh, that all have a negative charge. Uh, but sulfur, nitrogen, and phosphorus, even without a negative charge, are fantastic nucleophiles. Um, not as good as when they're negatively charged, but they're still pretty good nucleophiles and they can definitely do SN2. Uh, so if you've got a strong nucleophile that's a weak base, you're doing SN2 uh, in all likelihood. A uh, couple exceptions here, so but by and large SN2. And then finally, at the very end here, we've got the strong bulky bases. And because they're bulky, they're not great nucleophiles. So we don't usually have to worry about these guys doing SN2, and largely they're just going to do E2. Now one exception here, it turns out like if you've got T-butoxide with a methyl halide, well methyl halides can't do elimination, so you can't do E2. And it turns out T-butoxide with a methyl halide will still do SN2. But outside of that exception here, the bulky bases are really just doing uh, E2 reactions. Uh, so basically when you start looking at uh, predicting products and predicting mechanisms, the first thing you want to really focus on is your nucleophile or your base uh, and figure out which of these classes it falls into because that'll really identify 99% uh, of the time what reaction mechanism you're largely going to be doing or what mechanisms are going to be competing. So our first example here, we've got methanol as our nucleophile slash base. Uh, and if you recall here, methanol is just an alcohol and is therefore a weak nucleophile and a weak base, and we should be leaning towards both SN1 and E1. Now, if we look at our halide here, our halide is a secondary halide, and with a weak nucleophile, weak base, and a secondary halide, like we just said, SN1 and E1 are going to compete. Uh, now, when you're doing SN1 and E1, I highly recommend, first thing you do is show the carbocation that you're about to form to check for rearrangements. And in this case, we're not going to have to worry about rearrangements. We've got a secondary carbocation and neither of the adjacent carbons is any better than that. So no rearrangements to worry about here. So we could do a substitution reaction and I'm skipping the mechanism here so it takes a couple steps but in this case we would attach in the end an OCH3 would end up attached here. This is not a chiral center so I don't have to worry about RNS. This is a single achiral SN1 substitution product here. 
So if we worry about elimination now, so there's my beta carbons. And in this case, they're totally equivalent. And so it doesn't really matter which one I choose to deprotonate to form the alkene. So I'll just use this one. Had I use the other one, the same diff. Uh, and in a six-membered ring, you can only form cis alkenes, not trans. So only one E1 elimination product. And it would be hard to distinguish a major versus a minor here. Maybe with heat being shown right here under the arrow, if it's hot enough, then maybe we'd get more E1 than SN1. It's more entropically favored at high temperatures. Um, but it, you know, it's really hard to distinguish between the two. So uh, not even going to label major and minor in this case, but there's your SN1 and your E1 products. All right, first thing we want to identify here is our base or nucleophile, and that's this guy right here. And that is potassium terbutoxide. He is a strong, bulky base, but not a very good nucleophile due to his bulkiness. Uh, and in this case, we've also got a tertiary halide, and we should note that with a tertiary halide, SN2 is not even possible. Uh, but in this case, our big bulky base should have leaned us towards E2 as being the major mechanistic route anyways. And that's why we got any strong base, not even the bulky one, it would definitely go the route of E2. So in this case, we're going to do E2 elimination. And in this case, there's our alpha carbon. We've got a beta carbon here, here, and here. So this one is secondary, this one's primary, this one's primary. The two primary ones, it turns out, are equivalent. So we'll predict two products here, but with the bulky base and our tertiary halide, uh, the Zaitsev product will actually be the minor, not the major. It'll be the Hoffman product here that'll end up being the major. So, and then finally the Zaitsev product will be their minor. So just E2 being the mechanism of interest here, and we've got a major product and a minor product, Hoffman the major, uh, Zaitsev the minor. All right, so predicting the products here, again, the first thing you want to identify is either your base or your nucleophile, and that is this guy right here. That is sodium ethoxide, so negative charge here, positive charge here, it's an ionic bond, and sodium ethoxide is an example of an alkoxide, and it's both a strong nucleophile, <coughs> excuse me, and a strong base. As a strong nucleophile, it can do SN2. As a strong base, it can do E2. So both SN2 and E2 are on the board. Now, if we look here, our halide, though, is a tertiary halide. And if you recall, SN2 reactions, backside attack is completely blocked for a tertiary halide. So no SN2 in this case, so it's just going to end up being an E2 reaction. So, and in this case, there is our alpha carbon and it's being tertiary, it has three beta carbons. One that's primary here, another that's primary here, and another one that's secondary here. And this is not a bulky base, just a regular non-bulky base. And so we're gonna predict Zaitsev's as the major product here. And so in this case, that would be here. So, and then the Hoffman as the minor. Cool, so two products here predicted in this E2 reaction, Zaitsev major, Hoffman minor. All right, in this example, first thing we want to identify is our nucleophile or base, and in this case, it's N3 minus. Notice sodium's a metal, nitrogen's a non-metal, so it's ionic. And N3 minus is one of your examples of a strong nucleophile, but a weak base. As a strong nucleophile, it'll do SN2, but because it's not a strong base, it can't do E2, so really, we're just looking at SN2, and the fact that our solvent's polar apodic just kind of is a icing on the cake here, but we've got a secondary uh, halide. And again, with a strong nucleophile that's a weak base, just confirmed everything we just said, we're gonna be doing SN2. Uh, and in this case, we're gonna just come around and do backside attack, kick off the iodine, and we have to remember that when we do backside attack, if it happens at a, as a chiral center like it is here, you get inversion of configuration, and you only get the inverted product uh, not the stereo, or not the retained product at all. So just a single SN2 product to predict here. No competing E2 elimination whatsoever. Okay, in this example, first thing I want to do is recognize the nucleophile or the base, and that's sodium methoxide here, and that's ionic, so we got a negative charge, and so he's strong. And in this case, sodium methoxide is an example of an alkoxide, and it's both a strong nucleophile and a strong base. As a strong nucleophile, it can do SN2. As a strong base, it can do E2. They're both on the table. Now, in this case, we've got a primary halide, and so for our primary halide, we should have realized SN1 and E1 weren't even possible to begin with. Uh, but with our strong nucleophile, strong base here, we're predicting both SN2 and E2, and it turns out for a primary halide, backside attack is relatively unhindered. So SN2 is going to be the major and E2 the minor. So if we look at the SN2 product here, 
Uh, we're going to do backside attack and kick off the iodine with methoxide. And in this case, it's not happening at a chiral center, so I don't have to worry about trying to show the inversion or anything. There's no chiral center, it's just one achiral SN2 product. And that's going to be the major, as we just pointed out. And then if I want to do E2, so there's my alpha carbon, my beta is right over here, and I've got a couple of hydrogens there, and I'll deprotonate one of them, and I will form an alkene in this case and my E2 product. And the alkene here, uh, one side has two identical hydrogens, so there's no such thing as cis or trans or E or Z. So it's just a single E2 product, and that's our minor product. So again, SN2 major, E2 minor. All right, in this example, first thing I want to identify is the base or nucleophile, and that's sodium hydroxide. You should recognize this is ionic. Sodium's a metal, and oxygen's a nonmetal. So hydroxide here, it turns out, is our nucleophile or base, and it's both a strong nucleophile and a strong base. As a strong nucleophile, SN2 should be on the table, and as a strong base, E2 should be on the table. Uh, in this case, if we look at our alpha carbon here, this is a tertiary halide, and we should realize that SN2 reactions are not possible for tertiary halides. The backside attack is completely blocked. So with no SN2 possible here, we're just going to be doing E2 in this case. Uh, and in this case, E2 is going to be a little bit of a pain in the butt, but let's have some fun here. So there's our alpha, there's a beta carbon, there's a beta carbon, there's a beta carbon, but pH here stands for a phenyl ring, a benzene ring, and it will not have any beta hydrogens. Uh, so in this case, we've got two different regioisomers we could form, one with this primary beta carbon or one with this tertiary beta carbon. And with our regular non-bulky base here, uh, we should use the tertiary to get the major product and the primary to get the minor. Now I'm gonna draw the minor product first just because it's gonna be a little bit easier. Uh, in this case, with three H's there, um, I can see that it's already not going to have any E or Z or anything like that, so I don't have to worry about stereochemistry too badly. So if we draw that product, so these aren't involved, so their stereochemistry stays the same. Uh, but in this case, we're going to end up with a double bond to what used to be a CH3 and is now a CH2. Okay, so that's our Hoffman product, and that is our minor product. So the major one is going to be a little more fun. And you might recall the word anti-periplanar. So in this case, the relationship between the leaving group, bromine in this case, and the hydrogen on the beta carbon, they have to be anti-periplanar. And right now, they definitely are not. So I would have to rotate this hydrogen to where it was in that dashed position uh, and rotate around the horn here, if you will. So rotate that alpha-beta bond. Uh, till the hydrogen was anti-periplanar. So uh, rather than do that, I kind of cheat. So here's the way I kind of look at this. I first look at this and say, okay, if this were ready to form the E2 product in this conformation, I look and say that this phenyl group right here and this phenyl group right here, they point 180 degrees opposite. So if the reaction's ready to go now, and again, I realize it's not, but if it were ready to go now, those phenyl groups would end up trans. You'd end up with this product right here. So, and in this case, you'd end up with a methyl group over here and a methyl group over here, and this would be the E isomer. And again, the key, though, is that the reaction is not ready to happen. The H and the Br are not antiperiplanar, which means you're not going to get the E isomer. Well, and if you don't get the E isomer, well, the only other option then is get the Z isomer. So rather than even rotate it around, I just figure out, can I get what it looks like is going to happen? Yes or no? If no, I get the opposite isomer. So in this case, we'll get the Z isomer not the E. And so there's my Z isomer. This is your Zaitsev product, and it's going to be the major product. Cool. So E2 is the only mechanism possible here. Uh, the Z more substituted alkene was the major, and the Hoffman the minor. All right, this one's going to be just a little bit tricky. So First thing we want to identify is our base or nucleophile, and you might be tempted to look above the arrow and be like, there it is, wait a minute, that's actually not it. Notice bromine is our leaving group. That's not our base or nucleophile, that's our substrate. So normally we have the alkyl halide off to the left, and we have our base or nucleophile above the arrow. There's nothing that says that that's how it has to be. That's the most common way it shows up. That's the most common convention. But there's no rule that says that has to be that way. So uh, when you identify your leaving group, and in this case it's the bromine, that's your substrate, regardless of where it shows up. So here we have a methyl substrate. 
Uh, but the thing we need to focus on there is that there's our negative charge. That's our base or nucleophile. And when you have a negative charge on sulfur, that is a very strong nucleophile, but it is a weak base. As a strong nucleophile, it can do SN2, but because it's not a strong base, I don't have to worry about any E2 competition, or at least no significant amount of E2 competition here. Uh, so in this case, with a methyl halide down here, so the only thing I can really react it with is a strong nucleophile. Elimination is not possible unless you have at least two carbons, so no E1 or E2. Uh, and then you can't do SN1 with a methyl halide because the carbocation that would form would be ridiculously unstable. So the only possible mechanism here is SN2. And in this case, our sulfur is just going to come and do backside attack. It's going to attack the methyl carbon, causing the bond between the methyl group and the bromine to break. And we are now going to have our sulfur bonded to the methyl group. That is your only product. We did not form a chiral center. So that's the carbon we attacked. It's definitely not a chiral center. So we don't have to worry about inversion or anything like that. I mean, it did take place. We just can't tell the difference. Uh, so you get a single achiral product in this SN2 reaction. Cool. This was the last example I gave you. I gave you a number of examples because I wanted you to see how to work this. Hopefully you figured out now that the most important thing is first identifying your nucleophile or base and identifying it into one of these four classes. Then identifying whether your substrate is methyl, primary, secondary, or tertiary, and then figuring out how to predict your products from there. I would recommend doing this, uh, using these things in conjunction. Keep them handy, keep them in front of you, and work a number of examples, and eventually you'll find out that you need to look over at these less and less and less. One thing to note, don't just memorize these. Um, and I still want you to memorize them, I just don't want you to just memorize them. The best way to memorize them is to completely understand them. Understand what makes it SN2 or E2 or both, or SN1 and E1. So if you understand it, it'll make memorizing it easier. Uh, and it also just, I, I can throw some exceptions at you or some deeper understanding type questions at you that you're definitely going to get. But you definitely don't just memorize it understand it in the process of memorizing it. It'll serve you really well in the long run.